Well, hello, Life Group leaders. I hope that you're doing well this week. Uh, we have an interesting passage for you guys, and so uh, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to break it down, hopefully answer some of your questions, so that as you are finished watching this video, you feel better prepared and equipped and ready to teach the Word of God to your class this week. Well, our passage is Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20. Now, this is, like I said, an interesting passage. There's a little bit of um, confusion that comes from it. There's some questions that often come up. And so what I want to do is just kind of break it down, um, working through the text, and just kind of giving you some observations, some explanation as we go through it. But prior to doing that, just a little bit of context that I think is important. What we have to know is that, that Paul here in this story is, is now on his third and final missionary journey. And so he is... Um, now entering into Ephesus. Uh, this was a, a city um, in ancient years that is absolutely filled with uh, polytheism, with paganism, with the worship of all these different spirits and deities. Uh, we'll see some that there's some sorcery going on. There's a lot of demonic activity, very spiritual culture that Paul is going into, uh, which is quite unlike ours. And so anytime that we're reading a story that takes place in a culture that is completely different from the type that we live in, we have to understand that there's going to be um, uh, a little bit of confusion that comes with that, just because we're approaching the text with a completely different background than that which it was written. Uh, another kind of important context note on this is, you have to keep in mind, everything that happens here, this is prior to the completion of what we now know as the Bible. The scriptures are still being written. Uh, this is the apostolic age, and so the way that things work here is a little bit differently from the norm. It's not the standard. A lot of what we see here is maybe um, descriptive rather than prescriptive, as you may have heard said before. Uh, so let's just jump right into the text. Uh, beginning in verses uh, 11 and 12, the first thing I want us to see is the perception of miracles. What I mean by that is how miracles uh, are viewed and how we should view them. It says in verse 11, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When, the hang when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases, then evil spirits were expelled. So, so what we see right here is there's something really out of the ordinary going on. I mean, this is kind of incredible, right? If, if these garments that had just touched Paul, there seems to be so much power that, that Paul possesses, that even touching something that touched him brought healing, brought brought uh, release from demon possession, brought these great miraculous things. Once again, what we need to see, this is a special time in church history. This is not the norm. This is not how it is today. The church is still being established. Scriptures are still being written. And the church is being built upon the work of of the apostles, especially the work of Paul. And so what we see is specifically the apostles were given uh, special power uh, by the Holy Spirit because they were really going into uncharted territory. They were breaking new ground as they were going out into the world to build the foundation of what would ultimately be Christianity. The Holy Spirit provided them with extra miraculous Power, these signs and wonders that we see really to verify that they are in fact from God. Now as we read this, there's a lot of confusion that comes up about the power of Paul. Like I said, the way it's perceived here. that He seems, he seems pretty incredible. Uh, he seems almost more than just an ordinary man. I mean, there were even people that we read about in the Bible that actually thought that Paul was himself a God because of the works that he was able to do quite miraculously. He does some things more than Jesus did. We don't really read about um, things that Jesus touched bringing power to people. Jesus had to touch them himself. And so it can be uh, almost a danger to view Paul too highly here. But I want you to see two specific wordings. One, it describes these as unusual miracles or uncommon miracles. That this, again, is not normal. But number two, very beginning, what we need to see is God gave the power to Paul. That God gave Paul the power to perform these miracles. That this was not in any way anything that Paul was able to do 
This was nothing special about Paul. He had not unlocked some sort of uh, deeper spiritual power. He had not somehow figured this out or, or achieved uh, this untapped potential. This that we're seeing is just the grace of God. That's all it is. This is God in his wisdom and kindness and provision giving Paul what he needed so that the people in Ephesus would hear him and more importantly, hear the gospel. And so the way that we perceive these miracles and understand them has to be viewed through that lens. I want to continue on in the text, though. The second thing I want to look at is then what is the purpose? We talked about the perception, but what's the purpose of these miracles? Why do they happen? Why don't we see them so much today? Well, let's look at verses 13 through 16. It says, A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Now upon reading this, you're thinking, this is a pretty weird story. Once again, let me remind you that the type of culture that we are approaching this from is far different from that which it takes place. You see, we are a part of a culture that is as secular as it can get. The, the big question in the world we live in today is, is God real or not? Is there a spiritual realm or is there not? We view everything just purely uh, um, materially speaking. Just if you can see it and if you can feel it, then it's real. And if you can't, it's not. The people in this culture at this time, they didn't view the world this way at all. Might I say, they probably viewed the world a little more accurately than we do in our um, postmodern um, naturalist kind of mindset that we've adopted. Nonetheless, their question was not, is God real or not? Is there spirituality or not? Their question was, which spirit is the most powerful? And that's really still the way that many cultures around the world view it as well, where you see more polytheism and things like that. They don't deny or even question the existence of the supernatural. What they are concerned with is, where's the power? Which is the greatest? Which has the most authority over this spiritual realm? And that's what they kind of want to hitch their cart to. And that's kind of the question that these men were, were, were seeking after is they realize that this is all out there. They just want to have as much power over it as possible. Now, oftentimes we, we, we assume that there's miracles in the Bible because the Bible is just special and it's full of miracles. That's not really the case. You know, there's only about 265 miracles in the whole Bible. Now, while that might seem like a lot, the Bible covers the span of about 4,000 years. And so it's easy to think in the Bible, miracles were happening all the time. This is just how it was. That's not the case. They're uncommon. They're especially uncommon in the New Testament, which means when the miraculous happens, there's a specific reason why it's happening. Every miracle you see, especially in the New Testament, there's a purpose behind it. So what is the purpose of miracles? Well, especially with Paul, what we see the purpose is very simple. It is verifying the message that Paul is proclaiming. The purpose, in short, is the gospel. What's going on here is, is, is Paul is entering into a, a world where they've never heard of Jesus or they have no reverence for Jesus. They have no reason to take Jesus seriously. There is no Bible. There's no history of Christianity. There's no Christian culture. There is zero reason for anyone to give Paul the time of day, much less take his claims of Jesus of Nazareth seriously. And so what's going on here is the Spirit is empowering him in this missionary evangelistic effort to do the impossible, to do these supernatural works so that as people see this, they take it seriously. They realize, hey, there's there's some substance to what this guy is saying. And so we see these Jew, Jewish people here that are casting out demons. Uh, this really comes across like more of a, of a fraud business than anything because this guy they mentioned that's leading it, there's actually no record of him as a priest anywhere in the history of Judaism. And so he's probably lying, 
He's probably putting on an act, and he's probably just trying to make some money off of some people uh, that are being oppressed by the demonic. Nonetheless, they're kind of taking this polytheistic approach. They say, hey, we just want to, you know, uh, perform these great works, cast out these demons, cash a check. And they realize this Paul guy over here, he's having such great success. He doesn't have to do it. People that just touch his garments are getting um, liberated from these things. And so we're going to try to tap into that deity as well. Obviously, it doesn't go well because they just try to name drop Jesus. And sure enough, what happens is the demon says, look, I got respect for Jesus and Paul. I know who they are. I recognize the authority that Jesus has over me. But what I don't know is who you are, particularly because they have no connection to Jesus. What we see here is, is that we can't separate the power of Jesus from relationship with Jesus. I think this is a great opportunity for you to kind of get real uh, practical and specific with your group. They might be really interested in the whole question of miracles and the demonic and the, the spiritual side of things. But we also have a lot of people, they're just trying to get through another week. And this is a really great way to kind of ground this lesson, um, bring it home for a lot, is, man, how are you trying to have the power of Jesus in your life without the relationship? How are you trying to um, benefit from the perks of Jesus without the submission that comes to Christ. You see, so often I find that what people want to do is they, they say they want Christianity. What they want is the blessing. They want a God they can pray to. They want a God that loves them unconditionally. They want someone to go to when they're in need. They want someone to change their circumstances. They, they want all the things that Jesus says he can do, but they don't want to live the life that God calls them to live. They want the perks without the cost. But what Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so don't misunderstand. This is not a workspace relationship. And that Jesus gives us far more than we could ever give him. But nonetheless, following Jesus is not just about what Jesus does for us. We see a great history whenever Jesus was on earth. The people that just wanted what they could get out of Jesus. They just wanted a free meal. They just wanted a healing. They just wanted to witness a miracle. And Jesus says, you don't understand who I am or why I'm here. Because that's not what you need. What you need is your sins forgiven and to be unified with the God that created you. The one for whom you exist. But in the flesh, they miss that. These Jews here miss that. So many people in our churches miss that. They want what Jesus can do for them, not Jesus himself. I think this is also, um, if you're familiar at all with the, the new apostolic reformation movement that's taking place, uh, it, it's kind of a branch of Christianity that really ceases to be that because they emphasize so strongly the signs and wonders, the ability to prophesy and work miracles and heal and speak in tongues and all of these miraculous things that the focus of their faith is the power rather than knowing and glorifying Christ. Listen, I don't care where you go to church or what you do. If the central purpose of your relationship with Jesus is about anything other than having Christ, you're missing it. If it's about anything, about what you can do, about what it can do for you, if it has anything to do other than getting to have Christ, the greatest rich, that the, the greatest treasure, the greatest blessing, the greatest thing that you could ever possess is Christ. And if your Christianity is about anything else but Christ, you're missing it. These guys were missing it. And we see the consequences of that folly. Third and finally, I want you to see the power that miracles have. We've seen kind of the misperception, if you will. We've seen the purpose behind them to verify the gospel. But finally, number three, let's look at the power that they actually have. You see, Jesus accomplishes exactly what he intended to accomplish with the miraculous. Look at verses 17 through 20. The story of what happened spread quickly all throughout Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. And a solemn fear descended upon the city in the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became who became believers, confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them in a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord was spread widely and had a powerful effect. 
Jesus accomplished exactly what he intended to do. You see, when, when people realize the power of Christ, the response was repentance. The response was submission to him. They realized that, that Jesus isn't just some other spirit. He's not just another option on the buffet of religion. And that's really what we need to see here too. You see, their idea was that there's all these different spirits out here. But as the word got out about this story, that even the demons recognize the authority of Jesus, that that is where the power is found. That's the only person that has authority over all things. They realize, oh, this is who I need to follow. And so often we treat religion like that buffet where we can have as much as we want of each thing but but not really ever buckle down and 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 and, and lock in on that one what we have to understand is jesus is the only one that has the power jesus is the only one that can save jesus is the only one that can forgive jesus is the only one that can resurrect and redeem and so it's all about having jesus and these people realized it once again i talked about the, the reality that um, the sorcery, the, the, the supernatural, this paganism was so prevalent in this city. We see to what degree, as their great sin really was practicing it. And, and so, not to get off topic, but just to point out what the scriptures describe here, that the, this sorcery stuff is real. I think, once again, growing up in, in such a secular culture that kind of shrugs off the supernatural, we like to joke that that's nothing to really be worried about. Um, anytime someone's, uh, you know, fearful about uh, the possibility of things like sorcery, witchcraft, magic, all those things, we kind of play it off like a joke, like, oh, they're crazy, you know. But this is serious stuff. The demonic was using these people's obsession with sorcery and the supernatural to oppress and wreak havoc on these people. We have to understand, it's just because maybe we as a culture don't really recognize that this stuff is real doesn't mean it's not. Pretending like it doesn't exist doesn't mean it's not dangerous. And so, as Christians, I'm not saying you go full on and, 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 and be crazy about it. But we have to recognize, hey, this stuff's real. Be mindful about what your kids are watching, what your kids are doing, about the type of movies that you allow in your home, the type of things that you like to do, because the spiritual is real. And it can be dangerous as it was for them. But more importantly than that, what we see is Jesus has power over all of it. And so Jesus has authority to uh, vanquish all of those foes, to redeem his people from any of that spiritual oppression, and, and to use the displays of his power to make the gospel known. So it's an interesting story, um, one that I'm sure will have a lot of uh, questions being asked from your group. So I hope that this has helped. I hope this will uh, give you the tools you need to be able to answer those questions and use the Word of God to teach your class this week. I'm praying for you guys. Y'all have a good one. I'll see you on Sunday.